our guest today is Christoph Reinhardt from MIT. Uh, can you tell us the name of your lab? Sure. Uh, I'm from the Department of Architecture, and there we have the Building Technology Program, where um, a number of faculty are working on various aspects related to the built environment, and I lead the Sustainable Design Lab. Beautiful. Cool. You know, you know, Tito, I graduated from the undergraduate version of that program back in 1981. I know. We should make you uh, at one of our alums. We should have busts of all the alums along the wall. <laughs> Good idea. Yeah, they could, they could be uh, 3D printed. In, uh, some kind of, uh, <laughs> we exchange that bust once a month. We say that's the alum of, the, uh, of that period. Just make it out of chocolate. It'll disappear. You know, disappear. <laughs> In the years that we've been trying to get you on the show. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce, for pointing that out. <laughs> I've, I've been reading different papers. Like, there's a paper about the uh, building structure being on the outside. So like exoskeletons and these optimized buildings for like shading and material use and, you know, daylighting. I mean, it, it, and, and that was just like, oh, my God, that's like one of the coolest papers I've ever read. And the possibilities, enormous. And, and then, and then you're, ta you're talking to me about... Um, Container far uh, container farms and like doing urban agriculture in shipping containers, you know, hydroponic uh, and just how the, the energy and um, local food implications. That's like holy cow! That's like one of the most interesting things I've ever heard. And then you did that study. You're a co-author of that blue bike uh, data analysis, biking around Boston and Cambridge. Now that we have thousands of uh, Blue bikes. blue bikes and data on the blue bikes and like the micro urban microclimate that causes people to choose to bike or not, um, depending on the rain and the temperature and the shading and the wind and all. And it's like, holy cow. And, and, and then, um, Wait, oh, and then, you're, and then you're a national expert on daylighting and building <laughs> simulations, you know, and, or international expert. And it's just like, holy cow, I don't know what we're going to ask Tito to talk about. We don't even need Tito. We just have you telling the cool <laughs> stuff Tito's doing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I sometimes are in these situations when we talk with international firms and I try to uh, explain what our work is. And usually I kind of frame it as, as this big societal issue that we have that we know we have about uh, 600,000 gigatons of carbon left as a human society. Uh, and we can use that up to make the global economy carbon neutral. That's kind of the moment where we are at right now if we want to keep global temperature rise between one and a half and two degrees C. So this kind of gives us a budget, and I think this is a good way to think about it. And then since in the building sector we are responsible for 40% of this, uh, we can basically give us this as our budget. So let's say we have 300 thousand gigatons of carbon left and then 30 years and we have to make the whole uh, building stock in the whole world carbon neutral and when you look at it that way there's another I think interesting statistic without boring people that in the next 30 years we're going to double the built environment worldwide so we're going to build as many buildings floor plan area wise in the next 30 years as we've built in the last 5,000 years. Uh, which is a scary thought. So when you take all of that together, it's nearly overpowering. So we have to say, okay, there are two things that we have to do. We have to dramatically increase the renovation rate in the world. And if you look at a lot of the U.S. stimulus plan or now the Inflation Act, basically put a lot of money on the table to help homeowners do that. So part of our lab uh, what we are doing is we've been working with 20 cities around the globe and helping them think through how to do that. Because there's a really funny process right now in place, which is that cities tend to know how much carbon they use. I mean, how do you do that? You call your local utility and ask how much how much gas and electricity do you sell us in a given year? And then you know how much carbon that is. And then they heard that uh, London and New York want to be net zero in 2050. And then they say, well, I want to be net zero too. And so you would be stunned how many large and small towns do that. And then we are trying to find in all towns and cities the poor person that was told by the mayor, we have to be carbon neutral in 30 years. And they are completely shell-shocked and they have no idea of how to do that. And uh, this person is we call them the sustainability champion is usually highly motivated because of course you have to be a communicator that brings a whole city 
to uh, to implement retrofitting uh, measures in buildings that are not owned by you because buildings are privately owned. So that's where we come in and we do these um, technological pathways where we show them if you do, uh, you know, if you get new appliances and uh, LED solid state lighting and you get a heat pump uh, and photovoltaics and we all do that, then we're going to reach our goal. And I think for a city government that is really powerful because that way they have a goal and they can rattle their uh, or bring their community together and say, you all have to do that. And if you do your part, then we're going to reach our goal. That, that is really the, the idea here. And we've done a lot more work recently where we've looked at, um, well, are people going to do it and who's going to do it? So we are doing this uh, on top of the technology, this socioeconomic adoption models. And there it's really interesting when you see that uh, that you are very likely end up in the next 30 years unless we dramatically change our incentive structure is that the affluent households with home ownership, they're going to update their building. So if we kind of let the world run its course in the US, we probably have a lot of zip codes where people have highly efficient building envelopes because they want to be comfortable. They have an electric car, they have a, um, a battery, and they have solar, and they are close to net zero. We still need a strong grid, but that's kind of how the, the future is going to look like. The big problem is there are all these other zip codes where nothing's going to happen because the ownership is low, and then it's going to be even worse because if less people buy uh, natural gas, then the gas will be more expensive. So I think there's a key effort right now for us to use the money that the government will have to put on the table and distribute it in an equitable way. And I think part of that right now is we are over-subsidizing photovoltaics dramatically. It's too good of a deal. So I think what one would rather do is you combine the photovoltaics, if you want money from the government, then you also have to get a battery and you have to get a heat pump so you electrify, so you're not part of the problem. And so I think the, this packaging is for the existing building stock a, a really good solution. Your lab is reaching out to cities all over the world. One and a half years ago, we did this with eight cities, and that was a really fun group. We had Singapore, uh, Cairo, Florinopolis in Brazil, Montreal, Kiel in Germany, Dublin, um, Braga in Portugal, and uh, Middlebury, Vermont. <laughs> wow. And we were for three days together uh, on this uh, during COVID uh, uh, on a uh, on a call, well, eight hours a day, and basically we got a bunch of MIT students working with the city governments, and we basically trained them what is uh, using a seed model, a little neighborhood of what you should do to this uh, your neighborhood to reach your carbon goal. And uh, it was a great process. And we used these kind of as drivers for our motivation and just to see where our workflows are complicated and then make them better, right? We then literally take them back to the lab and we fine tune the process. And we did the same uh, once more with six North American cities. And then three weeks ago, I was in Portugal and we did it for a week with uh, Lisbon, Porto, Zagreb, and Rotterdam. And it's it's so great to uh, meet the sustainability champions. They are very often architects, not that I'm promoting that as a field, but uh, uh, they are often, uh, you know, vice mayors of big cities and they have a good sense of the built environment and they understand the technology uh, well. And they have also a sense for graphic and aesthetics. And so they have their home pages. Like my big revelation was the vice mayor for um, Zagreb in Croatia, they have like this super, uh, they have a solar map that they built themselves and then they have a map that shows what they do to their own building and then they're publishing the energy use of all buildings in Zagreb, which would be completely illegal in the US, but they do it to, to drive change and it's, it's great, right? So, I mean, that's probably the most fun part uh, and I basically want to have, obviously there's a lot of work on the technology side on our end, but I try to hide all that. I mean, we, I, I rather like us spend months making certain things easier so that these people um, 
love it and can make decisions on top of that. So, so now that all these champions know in their city what needs to be done in terms of technology and change, right? And, the, and, the, and then, then they have to go back and convince everyone to do it. Well, then they quit. No, <laughs> no. They're in a political position and they're not reelected, which can be a problem. Yeah, I think in most cases, actually, the people we deal with are not the political uh, uh, figureheads. It, it's really more the people that are in the position of someone, I don't know, taking action. It, it's, it's very hard. I think the number one thing that I've learned from all of these examples is uh, cities completely underestimate the effort level. I mean, just the notion that you would bring all buildings in the city uh, towards, you know, an energy star standard, that a quarter, half of all rooftops are covered in photovoltaic, that sounds so utopian, right, nearly. And uh, I think people don't understand how big those, uh, uh, you know, how massive these goals are that we are setting ourselves. So, And sometimes we set the goals for like 2050, but then next thing you know, there's some city like Cambridge saying we have to be uh, net zero by 2035. And then they're like, oh, is that not fast? Yeah, it's, it's, so there's this kind of like... Yeah, I, think, uh, I mean, the, yeah, I mean that's exactly. I mean, that, that is a total pipe dream. And but, I mean, what I would say, we really want to... I'm not a big fan of carbon offsets. And I think people could combine that until, uh, until the cows go home. But I think... Uh, I think in terms of uh, demonstrating activity on the ground, I think we should do the, uh, try to do the hard things, such as you know updating the buildings. And an interesting part, I think, in general is when you look at companies and just activities, people that, that are doing are in this retrofitting world, most of them are doing photovoltaics, heat pump, if people already have an air conditioning system because you just switch out a box, and then weatherization, and nobody touches the walls because that's so hard to do. And um, and I mean, if you look at your own building or if you look at mine building, it's super hard to do because you have lead paint on the inside. So this is really where it's at right now. And this is what I would love to help solve in the next eight, nine years that we, um, we, we have good measures there in place. You're saying it's all about weatherization and thermal integrity and controlling the air exchange rate while you maintain good indoor air quality. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I mean, and of course, the benefits of doing that is that the building is more comfortable, it's more healthy. We know there are all these benefits. So ultimately, people are doing that. Typically, when people maybe get a renovation going, anyhow, or get a new extension to their building or a new bathroom or kitchen, right? That, that's when these things kind of happening. And that again shows that doesn't cover the whole all households. And it never happens in rentals. I mean, I, I guess even no landlord in their right mind, unless they are, uh, un unless they really want to do it for the good of the world, would do it because I mean, the, the uh, you don't get rent for the time of the renovation. You don't know what you find in the wall. Anything you know, you have to fix. It's it's very very hard, right? But maybe if you want, we can also p uh, pivot on the other side. So usually, I say basically part of is is all the buildings that exist. We have to do something. And then I think the work that, we, uh, the work that people get more excited about, such as the agriculture and the uh, structures, that's, of course, new construction, right? And there, I think the big topic of the day is, and a lot of uh, firms are working on that, is that we don't only have to make new buildings as low operational energy use as possible, but also work on the embodied energy. And I would say a lot of designers love that because... Ultimately, the HVAC system, that's not really their thing. I mean, it's good, good designers understand it, but the, the choice, if you use concrete, if you have an efficient structure, if you use wood, that is purely architectural and that just makes people happy and uh, uh, confirmed in their own work right? when, when they do that. And so that's where ideas such as the solar exoskeleton, and that is something, as you said, a lot of people love it. it uh, and um, you see actually some high-end work from like big end uh, high-end design firms, even like Sarah, uh, like uh, Hadid or so, uh, that um, these buildings make, uh, they make an architectural statements, they look great. And uh, of course, the moment you manage to have the structure outside of the building, you have way more flexibility on the inside. I would say all high-tech spaces right now from you know, the NVIDIA headquarter or the new Google buildings are like these gigantic circus tents in a way, like huge roofs, 
with no structure in the middle so that you can move people around any way you want and you can and in order to do that these kind of um, uh, solar exoskeletons are perfect for that right you have basically a really strong performative envelope around the building and you just have large spans and uh, and, and if those exoskeletons were stupid for energy or embodied energy or performance energy then there'd be this trade-off of do you want to have the flexibility of how you use the internal space, but, but they're actually good for the... Yeah, I, I mean, in that paper, really, the nice thing is what I liked about it as well is we basically showed that the two are a little decoupled, right? You, you can make a good or bad structure, and then that structure can be energy efficient or not. And that's, of course, uh, what you really want to hear, that you don't play off one against the other. I mean, I should say we haven't looked in that paper at cost, which would, of course, the number one next question of how to construct these systems, but... Um, uh, in terms of material use, they're significantly better, right? Yeah. And it's just a, a new, fun way of thinking about how to put a building together. Right?